brain cells look like under the microscope. Can anyone guess how many we were born with? It's a big number. Have a guess. A thousand? Way more. A billion? Much closer. It's a hundred billion. A hundred billion of these. Now, we tend to think that smart people were born with more. It's not true. We were all born with pretty much the same number. Smart people have more neural connections between them. Every time you do something, a neural connection is built from one neuron to another until that becomes like a super fast highway in your brain. And it's quick and easy to do that thing. Einstein donated his brain to scientists after he died. They found more neural connections in the PFC than they'd ever seen before. The PFC here is what does thinking, reading, maths, solving problems, reasoning. That's why it's protected by such a thick bone. It needs protection. So the good thing is we determine our intelligence because we control the building of these neural connections. You can think about when your children were learning to walk. It wasn't easy for them, was it? They had to concentrate to put one foot in front of the other. They had to hold on to the furniture and they still fell down a lot. If you called their name in the middle of it, they lost focus and fell down. That's because the neural connection for walking wasn't very strong. Think about how many steps they've done in their lifetime since then, and we've got a super fast highway in the brain for walking. It is so good that they can walk backwards in the dark while they're singing, because they don't have to think about the walking. If you've known anyone who's had a stroke, part of the brain tissue dies and they lose those skills. It could be walking, it could be talking. But the good news is our brain is plastic, meaning it can change. So with the right rehabilitation and the right exercises, they can build those neural connections somewhere else and learn to do that skill again. The old saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. I think all of us would be able to say that there were some physics formulae that we knew in high school if my life depended on it today, I couldn't tell you what they are because I haven't used them for 20 years. So my brain has rubbed them out and has built new neural connections for the other things that I'm learning. So because of how this works, that's why the everyday is really important. If your um, children did it only at school, they would miss out on opportunity to build those neurons faster. And the way the brain learns to read is a process called orthographic mapping. The brain will look at the letters and be taught in prep that this is the letter C and the sound is K, and they need to make that connection. The ease by which they do that is determined by how their brain is wired at birth. Some brains, it's just, it happens by osmosis almost. Some of you may have had that own experience for yourselves in learning to read. It just happened. You didn't even need to try hard. And then it's really hard for you to understand why it might be very difficult for your own children. Then some of you would have a different experience where it was really hard for you at school and you struggled and then you can understand and have greater compassion for your own children who might be struggling. So it depends on how the brain is wired. If your brain is wired that orthographic mapping happens easily, your brain looks at the letters k, a, t, and can blend those and say the word cat. And if your brain is orthographically mapping, your brain can look at that and say, if I change the t to n, that's can and they start to do that. Think about all the words that you can read now. You haven't had uh, enough times of memorizing that word for it to be in the long-term memory on its own. All of you have eventually learned to orthographically map in your brain. Also, if the child looks at the word cat and changes the at to o, oh, they can work out that's a new word, cot, without much effort. So they're able then to build a whole repertoire of words that they can recognize for both reading and then they can also spell them. So our students that we are working with in the small group program are struggling with that process. It's not happening naturally. So we're going to create lots of opportunities for that to happen. So that's why every day all of that practice is going to be really important. So Lillian Fawcett is the author of the program. She's in Perth now. She is taught overseas um, in the UK, also in parts of Asia. And um, she has her PhD in psychology. Everything that she has put into the program is evidence-based. 
There's a, a book called Overcoming Dyslexia. It was, came out maybe about 10 years ago now. I only read that book about six years ago. And when I read it, I thought that Lillian had read the book and written this program, but she actually wrote this 20 years ago. But it just shows that everything that we're going to be doing in the program is evidence-based, which means that we know that it's going to work. This is Frith's literacy acquisition model, which just is a very brief explanation of how the brain uh, will learn to read in a very simple model. So students will start in what's called the logographic phase. Some of you may have learned to read at school with the whole language approach to reading. When I arrived in Australia in 2006, I said to the teachers, how do you teach reading? And I was told we immerse the children in literature and then they can read. That's based on logographic principles, that enough exposures to a whole word and the student will memorize the word and be able to read it. Now this relies on enough exposures and a brain wired to be able to retain those images of the word essentially for automatic and effortless retrieval. The next phase of Fritz's model is the alphabetic phase and this is made up of two parts. The first one being phonological awareness. When I spoke a little bit earlier about cat and change the t to n, can, that's phonological awareness and manipulation. The ability to identify the sounds in a word and to manipulate them for reading and for spelling. Our phonological awareness ability is a stronger indicator of reading when it's measured in like a four-year-old. That measure is a stronger indicator than intelligence of a child's reading ability in year four because it is so important in learning to read. The other part of uh, alphabetic phase is alphabet code. So children need to understand that everything we say can be written down in a code. That's why Lillian called this cracking the ABC code. Children need to understand where one sentence starts and another one ends and the next one starts again. They need to understand that within the sentence there are a series of words. Each word can be represented in text. And then within each word, there's a series of sounds. In English, we have 44 sounds, but only 26 letters of the alphabet. So we have to have a, a sharing of those letters to make enough graphemes, that's the letter combinations, to represent a sound. So they need to be able to understand that those are the series of sounds in the word, and I can use different letters to represent those sounds differently, and it depends on where in the word. So when we start to break this down, we can see why it can be very overwhelming for them. This is from that book, Overcoming Dyslexia, by the Shea Witzes in America. Everything that we knew about dyslexia before the 90s was from post-mortem study of brains. And they could physically see a difference between a dyslexic brain and a typical reader's brain. With the functional MRI scan in the 90s, they could study the brain and its absorption of oxygen-rich blood in areas that are being worked, and they could see what happens to a dyslexic brain and a typical brain in reading. Which one would you say is the dyslexic brain? One on the right, hands up on the right, hands up on the left, hands up if you're not sure. Okay, that one is the dyslexic brain. Look at all together, there is much less activation altogether. And this area, which is for the phonological awareness task, zero activation. But, but the good news is our brains are plastic. Neuroplasticity, we can change our brains. And the Shaywitzes have done studies doing a, a scan before and after intervention. Intervention very similar to what we're doing in cracking the ABC code, and they saw brain change. So that's really exciting. When it gets hard, when your children don't want to do it anymore, and they're complaining that it's tough, remind them we're changing your brain. In every homework session, their brain will be changing. Back to Fritz's model, we've also got the next phase, which is the orthographic phase. So this is where we understand, for example, the Greek and Latin origins of words, and that helps us to read and spell words and know the meaning. So we then would know that pasteurize is named after Louis Pasteur, which is why it has the French spelling. The word beautiful comes from the word beau, which is again French spelling. 
We have lots of French spelling because in the year 1066, the French people invaded England, took over the whole country and forced everybody to speak French. The English would have hated that. Eventually, the English kicked them out back to France, went back to speaking English, but we kept a lot of words from that time, like the beau and chef, all of those sorts of words like chauffeur. So we've got that rich, rich history of English where we have adopted words from all sorts of languages. And we've also changed the way we speak over time. The letters GH used to be pronounced as a guttural, this is not gonna sound good, in the German language, they still pronounce it in that way. I'm so pleased we don't, because it hurts my throat. So the word daughter used to be daughter. But because it's hard to say that, and because we're lazy, we don't pronounce the GH anymore, it's silent. At the end of a syllable in a word, we still pronounce it as f, like in laugh. And then at the beginning of a word, we pronounce it as g, like in ghost. So we've got all this richness that is, um, making it hard for our children to learn to read and spell, but it adds so much to the language, and it's quite fascinating when we are able to study that. So in a study of university students who were spelling, they found that students who had poor orthographic knowledge were poor spellers. I learned by seemingly osmosis. I started grade one six months late, but just took off to reading and spelling with ease. I was in the top spelling group, I wrote my words three times each week, got 19 out of 20 in the test on Friday, and importantly, remembered them two weeks later. That's because I was able to orthographically map without any effort. So I learned that biggest needs EST, and artist needs IST by exposure to the word. And if somebody says to you, why is it spelt that way? We might say, because it looks right. There's actually a whole depth to why it is like that. I-S-T, the suffix, means person who does something. So that's why artist is I-S-T. Dentist, dent is Latin for teeth. So dentist, I-S-T, person who works with teeth. Florist comes from flora, person who works with flowers. Then biggest is comparing three or more, so that's why it's E-S-T. All of that comes into orthographic knowledge. We need to understand how memory works, because if the children can't remember what we're teaching, it's not going to be effective. So what we know about the memory research is we learn best when we link new knowledge to the existing knowledge. Barbara and her team did a big job assessing the children to measure where their starting point is. From there, they were able to group them accordingly, and then we can build on what they already know and limit any gaps. We all learn best when we integrate knowledge. So what we'll do is we'll teach them this is the sound and this is where we use it in the word. And we will teach them a rule and the rule breaker as well. I've heard a lot of teachers say, why bother teaching the rules because of all the rule breakers? The reason is 85% of our words follow the rules. And if you're not orthographically mapping, you need to know those rules to help you. So that's why we teach them. Yes, 15% of the words break the rules, just like we've maybe got 15% of our students that break the rules in the school. We love them anyway, and we just embrace it and we tackle it head on. So we say, this is the rule, just be aware of these little words that break the rule. When a child can explain why it is a rule breaker, then we know that they completely understand the rule and can apply it. Going back to memory, we all learn best when we can use a picture. When a customs officer or a police officer is asking you a question, they are watching to see where you look. If you look up to the left, you are remembering a fact and a picture. If you look up to the right, you're creating a story. So just be aware of that next time. So pictorial, all of us remember best with pictures. So we'll have a look at those that we're gonna do today. Multisensory, the more senses that we use, the more parts of our brain we use, so therefore, the faster the learning will be, and the easier it will be, and the better the retention will be. Rehearsal. Repetition is the key to learning. We look today at how we build those neural connections, so repetition is really, really important. Now we're going to have a look at how we teach the sounds. In the front of your booklet, you have got the stories for level three. So I think we've got a parent here or some parents for level one. In level one, your children are learning the alphabet. They'll master that in six weeks. Level two, where we're learning one sound. 
at a time. Level three, they're learning the multiple graphemes, the letters for that sound. So there, for example, A, please note that when you have letters in slashes, we're talking about the sound. So wherever you see letters in slashes, please read the sound, don't say the letter name. So the story for A is that the rain is falling on the cake sitting on the tray. And then we teach them that A at the end of a word is made by A-Y. This is level two, where they will learn a little song and H make sh for ship. So they can sing that with you. When they're practicing this, they must trace over the letter and sing it as they do it. S and H make sh for ship, sh for ship, sh for ship, S and H make sh for ship. And then they cross the midline clapping, sh, sh, sh. Crossing the midline is very important for getting both sides of the brain to work together. Notice that I said s and h, not s and h. That's because the letter names don't help you to read. The letter sounds do. And remember, we're building on what they already know. And they've already learned the alphabet, a, b, k, d, e. So we're building on that. So try and get them to say s and h make sh for ship. Then this is level three. The rain is, sitting, is falling on the cake that is sitting on the tray. This information in the box there is very important. That teaches you that if A is the last sound in a word, you're going to use A-Y. Moving forward, if your children say to you, how do I spell the word Drake? I want you to no longer spell it out loud to them. That's not going to help them. We want them to, first of all, segment the sounds onto their non-writing hand. So if they're right-handed, they'll do it on the left hand and vice versa. Everybody do it with me now with your non-writing hand. Show me the sounds in Drake. Let's go. D, R, A, K. So there's four sounds. So then your child will start to write the D, R, and then we'll say to them, the A is like A in cake. So we're preventing error. And then notice that we're talking about the picture, not saying the letter name. So they're going to know that the magic E, sorry, the bossy E makes that say A, so that will help them to spell that. Preventing error is really important when we have a think about these neural connections. How often do we see spelling like that? Your children will have a word that they've spelt wrong for years and it really frustrates them. And every time they spell it wrong, they're reinforcing a bad neural connection. And then you come along and you say, right, we're going to AC spelling words this week. And you work really hard on it on Thursday afternoon. You, even if you do it 12 times in a multisensory way like we're going to show you, that can't compete with a neural connection that's been built over three or four years. So then in the test, the brain will always default to the strongest neural connection, and they get it wrong. Try not to say, oh, how come you got it wrong? What happened? We did it 12 times yesterday. Weren't you thinking? I can't believe you got that wrong. We need to understand what's happening in the brain. It's not their fault. They tried really hard. They wanted more than you did for them to get it right. So we need to say, you know what? That means we need to build the neural connection a little bit more for the right spelling. So for example, with said, I use a mnemonic, said, Adam, in disguise. They need to do that lots and lots of times for that neural connection to be stronger than this one. Then, when this is very strong, this one becomes weak. Remember, if you don't use it, you lose it. Your brain, the brain will start to rub that out over time when we sleep, which is why sleep is so important for the brain. Then we get a weaker neural connection. Eventually, that neural connection is gone, and they spell the word correctly without even trying. That's how that brain plasticity happens. So we need to understand and be compassionate and encouraging and say, let's build the neural connection for the right spelling. We need to do a bit more work on that. The homework component for the graphemes will be a laminated sheet. We'll need to talk about that, Barbara. And I've printed out for you there an example of that. So the first page there, we've got level two, where they're going to write on there and say s and h makes sh for ship. So if you've got a writing implement, if you need one, make sure that your children say the sound as they write it. So we're going to go s and h make sh for ship, k and h make ch for chick, 
T and H make th for three. Just a word on the TH. I teach them this is the only time that they can point their tongue at you. And we want to see their tongue. Sometimes they have a confusion between the F, the F sound and the TH because they're not sticking their tongue out for the TH. So you can make a joke of it. I want to see your tongue. You can point your tongue at me here for three. And then E and E make E for tree. Make sure we're doing the sound. Those parents whose children are doing level three, yours are obviously a little bit more complicated. So they're going to write on there. They say the story, the rain was falling on the cake, sitting on the tray. Then they're going to write in there, A, I, A for rain, A, embossy, E, A for cake, A, Y, A for tray. This is a big one. It won't be coming soon. You'll have a few weeks to work up to this one. Five ways of doing ooh. If you look back to the story at the front, that will explain it to you, all the ways of doing the ooh sound. Under the moon is a man with a screw in his head. Ouch playing the flute with his foot stuck in some glue, wearing a suit. And they will learn that EW and UE are the ones that we use at the end of a word. Then the car is in the bath. A and er make R for car, and the letter A says R like in bath. And then three common ways of doing the O sound. The bow is on the bone in the boat. OW, O for bow. O in man, uh, bossy E is O for bone. O-A is O for boat, and they will learn that O-W is what we use at the end of a word. Level 2B vocabulary would look like this. So we've taught them the sound, sh, for ship. Now they're going to learn to read words with that sound. The pages that they bring home uh, may or may not be color-coded, what we want is for every grapheme to be colored. So if it hasn't been done at school, they need to trace over it and go s and hurt make sh for ship, s and hurt make sh for ship, s and hurt make sh for ship. And then they're going to read those words. Now the focus here is decoding, 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 decoding. We are not memorizing the word, we are sounding out, blending and reading. So we want two hands on what they're reading. When we use two hands, we are activating both sides of the brain. And so we want at least one finger, two is better, three is best, under the word. And they're going to sound out, shop, a uh, shopper, w -o -sh -ing washing, a uh, sh -a ashamed. That sounding out is really important. You want to support that. What is important is that they don't memorize these words in order. So the way that we stop that happening is we would sound out the words all the way and then we might say a word and they jump on it with their finger and say it. So should, they jump on it and say should. Shocking, shocking. Hairbrush, hairbrush. Then they can swap roles. So they say the word and you jump on it with your finger and say it. Make some mistakes and then that makes it a bit more fun. Also, randomly point to a word with a pencil, and then they need to read it as quickly as they can. But if they don't remember the word, they default to sounding out. That is the focus. And they will be able to um, either record their time or their errors on there. So they'll do it each day. The goal is to read 10 words in 10 seconds. When they've reached that goal, that's an indication that the words are in their long-term memory. We don't want any faster than 10 seconds. That defeats the purpose. If the staff notice that the children are trying to go faster than that, they will stop the timing and count the errors. Level three, they will need to highlight to color code those. Because we're short on time, Barbara, I think we'll leave that for now. But they will highlight the grapheme and say it as they go. And then again, they're going to be decoding the words. We want two hands on the page, and then they're going to go toll, er, eight, tolerate, afraid, afraid repayment, repayment. If they make an error, and for example, read tol, er, at, I want you to say, bossy e makes the at say a, eight. So not just correcting the word, please avoid the word no. Try and remove it from your vocabulary for the homework time. Say check or uh, to alert them to the fact that they've made an error and support them by um, segmenting the sounds, reminding them that's A for rain, let's do that again. 
make it really, really positive. The syllabification, these words will be syllabified already. We are teaching them to decode words that they've never seen before. So the way that we do that best is by using nonsense words. They will know the process that they find the vowel and draw a line after the next consonant. So at home, they just practice reading these words. So the first one, they would go ren, dish, op, rendishop, shan, ox, shanox. They will find that there is a real word thrown in there because that shows them that what they do to a nonsense word, they also do to a real word. The oral reading uh, text is a controlled passage. We are giving them lots of words from the list that they've learned. You will also see words from the previous units coming in, so we're consolidating those sounds. Their job is to read that text in 20 seconds. If they're going like Speedy Gonzales, though, we might need to stop the timing and count the errors. We want two hands on the page, fingers under what they're reading, because that's multisensory. I'd love you to find a small card that you're going to run from the top of the text as they go. And as the child gets to the second last word, move the card down. That means that they can't see the last word. If they get stuck and pause, you can flick the card up again to show them. Otherwise, keep going, and you'll be amazed at what this does. So they would read, I'm afraid that Jane sprained her ankle walking along the trail. So you can see I'm pushing the card down. What that does is it stops the eyes flicking back, it stops them regressing, gives them a bit of pressure to increase the speed and fluency. And then you'll say to them, did you see what just happened? You read a word you couldn't see anymore. That means that your brain is looking ahead and reading before your eyes even think they've got there. And that's what good readers do. That means you're a good reader. In each text, there will be one sentence that doesn't belong. They will probably have done that at school to identify that sentence doesn't belong. And then we want them to give you a summary of the main idea. The main idea, they need to tell you who it was about and what happened. The underlying word is for them to uh, develop some knowledge of the parts of speech. This is the oral reading for level two. So they've got uh, four texts over the week. It is better for your children to master one text well than to do four not so well. So the, the staff will be able to direct them as to how many they need to do. And if the students on level three master that first te text quickly, then there are supplementary ones that they can do as well. Then there is a spelling rule. So if you look on the middle page of your booklet, level three students are going to learn one spelling rule each week. A lot of you are going to learn a lot of the spelling rules. It was only when I started teaching students with literacy difficulties that I learned more than just I before E except after C. So this is a rule to practice the adding of a suffix. The block at the beginning there is the nonsense words. The children will do that as part of their classroom activities. The homework component that you're going to do is the real word exercise. So the first word there is rake and we're adding the suffix ing. And the rule that they're learning is e goes away when ing comes to stay or any other suffix beginning with a vowel. So we ask these leading questions. Does the vowel in rake, does the suffix, sorry, begin with a vowel in ing? Everybody? Yes, thank you. So that means we go on to the next column and it says e goes away and then we add on the suffix. Can you add the word raking there without the E? If you can write that in. Encourage your children to say the sound as they write it and then to say the word. In the next word, what is our base word that we are working with? Delete, thank you. What is the suffix we're adding? ED, and that means past tense. Does the suffix begin with a vowel? Yes. So then we go into the second column and that tells us that the E goes away and then we add on the suffix. Now your children might say to you, ah, oh, we don't need the E to go away, just add the D. Some of you also might be thinking that. We need to understand that ED is the suffix, not D. They don't literally need to rub out the E and write it again, 
But in their head, they need to understand that. Because if they think, oh, we just add a D, then we're going to get spelling like this. And we've all seen that a lot, haven't we? So we need to remind them the ED is the suffix, so the E goes away and the ED comes to stay. So over the week, they can complete that page. Now we get to the spelling component. I'll run through this one very quickly and then we'll do a practical session. This is very different spelling to what you've done before. The focus is on the sound symbol relationship. The first thing is the student reads the word watch and puts it in a sentence. I like to watch footy. You would also need to talk about the fact that this could be a verb, watch footy, can be a noun, I'm not wearing my watch. Then the student's job is to look at the word and fill in the answer sheet in their booklet, which is in your, um, we'll get to it in a moment, but you can see the questions on the next page here where we've got the words complain and above. So everybody looking at this word, how many letters are in watch? Five, we want your children to go one, two, three, four, five, one-to-one -one correspondence. What is the first letter? W, what's the first sound? W. Remember I said when we're talking about sound, the letters are in slashes, so we need the W in a slash. What's the last letter? H, last sound. Ch, lovely answers over here, thank you. So the Ch is in slashes. Clap the syllables, everybody. Watch. How many? One. If there's a family argument about how many syllables are in a word, you can put your hand under your chin. Everybody say, watch. Depending on how many syllables, that will be the number of times your hand moves down. So there's only one syllable there. What is the vowel in that syllable? A. And they're going to learn at school that the W does a bit of magic to the A and makes it say the O sound in that word. What is the silent letter in the word? T. What are the small words in that word? At. We're not changing the order of the letters, just looking at what's there and we can see the word at. Are there any double letters in that word? No. Letters written more than once? No. Now this question is asked for the colored letters. What makes the O sound? A. What makes the CH sound? CH like CH for chick. Then we hide the word Show me the sounds on your fingers for watch. W, O, CH. How many? Three. You don't need to write what those sounds are. You just need to put the number in. Then they're going to trace over it saying the sound with you. So they're going to trace over and go W, O. Don't say anything when you trace the T. And then CH. Then they do it on their own without you. And they're going to go W, O, CH. Then over the page... You will need to quickly sketch out the sound boxes. Remember there's three sounds, w -o -ch, but one silent letter, so you'll put that in. The student's job is to write the sound and say it, w -o -ch. then say the word watch. Then they will check that that is correct, then cover it with their left hand and write watch again on the lines neatly. So let's get down to that. On your page, we've got the word complain. Because time is short, we won't color code it. But the color coding exercise is very important. Show me the sounds on your fingers for complain. K, O, M, P, O, A, N. If the letter is giving the sound we expect, we leave it. What letters in complain are working together to make a new sound? The A, I, and remember that's A for rain, A for rain, excellent. So, we put the word in a sentence. Don't complain about what's for dinner. And then they count the letters, everybody, and you're going to fill it in on your sheet. How many letters are in that word? Eight. What's the first letter? C, first sound. K, and we're going to put that into slashes. What's the last letter? N, last sound. Mm, clap the syllables. Everybody, com, plain, two syllables. We ask this question about the vowels because every syllable has a vowel. So what are the vowels in the first syllable of this word? O. What are the vowels in the second syllable? 
A I, A for rain. Are there any silent letters in this word? No. Are there any small words in this word? Yep. Plain. Also even lane. I didn't write that in there, but can you add lane? He had lane down. Any double letters in that word? Double letters are two together. We have them in English for very specific reasons. In the word little, the T is doubled, and it's doubled to keep the vowel I saying the short sound. If there was only one T, that word would say little. And in the word little, the L is written twice, which is our next question. So there's no double letters. Are there any letters written more than once? No. What makes the A sound? A, I, A for rain. And then we cover it. Show me the sounds on your fingers for complain. Everybody. K, O, M, P, O, A, N. So then we're going to trace over it. So with your pencil, you're going to lead it with your child the first time. So let's go. K, O, M, P, O, A, N. Then they're going to do it again on their own without your support. K, O, M, P, O, A, N. Then over the page, you're going to draw the lines. So we need eight sound uh, boxes. Sorry, seven. So the way that you do that quickly, if you need seven sound boxes, you draw one large rectangle with six segmenting lines. So you would do that, and then your child fills it in. And remember, we want the sound letter combination happening there. So they're going to say it as they write it. And once the boxes are drawn, they're going to fill it in and go k o m p o a n. Then they will say the word complain and they will check. This checking is very important because it's self-editing. All of us find it difficult to see our own errors in our work. So don't let it just be a cursory, oh yeah, I got that right. Make them check. Even if they're pretty sure they got it right, they need to check letter by letter. Then they're going to cover that with their non-writing hand if they're right-handed or a piece of card or something and write it again on the lines saying the sound again. K -o -m -p -o -a -n. Then say the word complain. Let's do one more word, the word above. The E has come out funny because I used a different font, trying to make it dotted, because the E is silent. The reason that the E is silent is because, in this word, is because no English word ends in a V. Some of your children may have already learnt this from the staff, that the letter V is shaped like a vase for flowers, and we have one at home. The shape of the V is very unstable at that point. If it's at the end of a word, it's going to fall out. All the water will come out and the flowers will die, which is very sad. So the rule in English, no word ends in a V. We hold it up with a silent E. There are about five reasons why we have a silent E on the end of a word, and that's one of them. So the word is above. We'll put it into a sentence. The sun is above us. And then we're going to have a look at the color coding. So the letter A is not saying ah. That's why it's red. Doesn't matter what color they do it, just needs to be a color. The letter B is saying B, that's normal. The letter O is saying A uh, for love, which they will learn in uh, level three. The letter V is saying V, which is normal, so it's black. The E should be dotted because it's a silent letter, and now we know why it's there. So everybody, count for me how many letters are in that word. Five, if you can fill that in for us. What is the first letter? A, what's the first sound? A. Uh, so you're going to have a letter U in the slashes to represent A. Uh. The last letter is E. The last sound is V in slashes. Clap the syllables. A uh, above, two syllables. What's the vowel in the first syllable? A. What's the vowel in the second one? O. And we also have the E as well. Are there silent letters in that word? What is it? E, and we know why it's there. Are there small words in that word? 
We don't really count the A, so we'll just leave that. Any double letters? No. Letters written more than once? No. This question is asked, remember, for any of the colored letters. So what's making the A uh sound? The letter A, they will learn A uh in banana. And the letter, what is making the A uh sound? The second one is O, oh, A, uh, like in love. Show me the sounds on your fingers for above. A, uh, B, A, uh, V. How many sounds? Four. So we put four in the box. Then they're going to trace over it, saying the sound with you the first time, and then on their own. So we're going to go a, uh, b, a, uh, v. Don't say anything, but they must trace the e. And then on their own, a, uh, b, a, uh, v. And then over the page, how many sound boxes do we need? A, uh, b, a, uh, v, four. But we need to hold up the v with a silent e, so we need five sound boxes. So a big rectangle with four lines in the middle, and then you can just do some uh, dots around the last one to represent the silent letter. And the sounds, everybody, are a, uh, b, a, uh, v. Don't say anything when they write the letter, e, and say the word above. Then they check. Then they cover it and write it again on the lines, a, uh, b, a, uh, v, above. There are homework instruction sheets that the staff will make sure that you have. So it's very detailed exactly what you need to do at home to get the best, best results for your children. We do recommend that you have your children's eyes tested if they haven't been cleared already and hearing tested with an audiologist. And just to finish off, I wanted to show you a video of how you can help your children when they're reading a longer text. They all should be reading before bed. If they're able to read on their own a little bit, we want it done in three components. The first one is them uh, reading to you. And the second part is you reading, sorry, the second part is them reading on their own. You leave them for 10, 15 minutes to have that time quietly in their bed, developing a lifelong habit of reading before going to sleep. Then you come in again after 10 or 15 minutes Take it at face value where they say they're up to, and then you finish that chapter and possibly read the next one. What that means is they'll be finishing one of those little uh, chapter books, those short novels, in a week. That will give them a sense of accomplishment. The Magic Treehouse series is available in the school library and also the state libraries as well. That's a really good one for your students in year three and four. This is a student using one of those books, and I wanted to show you how I tackle the errors. Remember I said remove no. They don't need to hear no. Watch what I do, and then we'll talk about how I uh, targeted those errors. Jack, no, we haven't have to follow them, said Annie, for Morgan's sake. Good reading. Jack took a deep breath. She was right. Annie grabbed Jack's hand. Together they stepped into the water. Ye eeks. Magic E makes it say I. Ye eeks. Yikes. 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 There they both screamed at A. And? And jumped out. It was the coldest water Jack had ever felt. It was colder than ice. Good. In, it was so cold it felt like fire. I can't go back in, she said Annie. Good. Shivered, shivering. Good reading. Me. N -e N -e Neither, Good. said Jack. I, I, I'll have a Heart attack. Good. The ninja looked at ninjas looked at Jack and Annie. Then they turned around and came back. The tall ninja grabbed Jack. Help! cried Jack. Cried. Good. But the ninja left Jack. Left Jack. Cover the ed. What's the base word? Good. I lift. Lift. 
lift Jack. Lifted. Lifted Jack higher. High. Height. High. High into the air. Good. And put him on his shoulder. Good reading. The short ninja pulled any, but put put any on his shoulders. Good reading. What did you notice that I did there? Did you notice that the student had two hands on what she was reading? That's been drilled into her. That's turning on both sides of the brain. It's not fair for only half the brain to be doing that work. Think about that slide we saw. So two hands there, she was tracking with her fingers. There's nothing juvenile about having your finger under what you're reading. If we went to a speed reading class tonight, we would be taught as adults to have your finger under what you're reading. Everybody reads faster and more accurately with your finger under. And what did my pencil do? Yep, I paused when there was an error. I didn't say no, I didn't say anything negative. Pause, then she knows, ah, oh, I need to look at that again. What other things did I do? Lots of praise, lots of praise. All that she heard from me was positive. Anything else? Did you notice that I said I use magic-y, your school uses the language bossy-y? When she was reading Yikes, I reminded her the bossy E makes the it say I. So I'm not just giving her the word. She needs to do some work, but we're applying what she's learned in cracking the ABC code to help her to read that word. In the word neither, that she was struggling with that one, I only gave her the first two sounds, N E. And then that was enough for her to finish the word on her own. I also reminded her in the word, so she sounded out wild, W E L D. So I said, were I? And then she had to do the rest of that on her own. Did you hear me say, oh, that's A for rain? Linking back to that picture. And then also with the word lifted, I said, cover the ED. That draws her attention to that syllabification that she's going to be doing. So she looks at the base word, lift. I decoded those sounds, but my student had to do the work of blending those together to read the word. Then she had to add on the suffix. So lots and lots of positivity. Try not to say the word no. We will leave it there, everybody. I'm available here for questions if you would like to come and ask some questions. Thank you, Barbara and the team, for putting this on. I think it's really fantastic that the school is just running with the program, and I'm very excited to see the results.